Today, I'm making the ultimate steak sandwiches. It's grilled skirt steak on a grilled chia bottle roll, and it has this special sauce. It's blue cheese and balsamic, which sound like they don't mix, but when they come together, it is pure magic. These are the best steak sandwiches ever. And I'm gonna serve it with a simple potato salad with lots of herbs, some tomatoes, a little homemade iced tea, and follow it up with some coconut pound cake. Now, when I came up with this menu, I really had my brother in mind, his name is Rip, and he's so appreciative when I cook for him. I always make him steak and potato salad because those are his favorites. Now, to get started, I'm gonna work on the coconut cake because it's got a bacon cool. So, pound cake, notoriously fussy recipe. A lot of the older recipes you find, you have to have the butter at a certain temperature and the eggs at a certain temperature, and it got its name, really, because in the olden days, it was a pound of flour, a pound of butter, a pound of sugar, uh, but the ratios have changed these days to make it a little lighter, a little more forgiving. And the one thing we're gonna do is start with cake flour. This is two cups of cake flour, and that'll go a long way to not having a really dense, heavy pound cake. Now to that, we're gonna add some leavener. This is baking powder. We're gonna add a teaspoon of baking powder, half a teaspoon of table salt, and these are the dry ingredients. Just gonna whisk them together, and we're gonna set them aside while we put together the wet ingredients. And for the wet ingredients, we're gonna use the food processor because it really helps emulsify the butter into the eggs, and that's always the trickiest part about pound cake. So we're gonna start with some sugar. <laughs> it's a cup of sugar. We're gonna add it right to the food processor. Next up, some cream of coconut. Now this is what really is gonna give that coconut flavor. We tried using coconut milk, but actually the fat levels vary dramatically in coconut milk, and it didn't give us a strong flavor like the cream of coconut. So we're gonna use three quarters of a cup of cream of coconut. And if you make pina coladas, you know this stuff pretty well. In the supermarket, it's usually found with sort of the cocktail mixers. Using an adjustable measuring cup makes it easy. Right into the food processor. All right, next up, some eggs. Now these eggs are definitely at room temperature. I've had them sitting out for a while. We're gonna crack them right into the food processor. So if you don't have room temperature eggs and you're using them right from the fridge, a quick tip is to put them in a bowl, cover them with hot water, and they'll come up to room temperature within a few minutes. Now for the extract. We're gonna use a good amount of vanilla extract, a teaspoon and a half. Measure this right into the food processor. And this is the kicker, it's coconut extract. Now, you can't find it everywhere. There's a couple supermarkets around here that do have it, worth checking out. Can't use too much of it. If you overdo it, it will taste like suntan lotion. A little goes a long way. So we're just gonna add half a teaspoon into the food processor. Put the lid on, we're gonna let this rip about 10 seconds until it's nice and combined and uniform. All right, that looks pretty good. Next, we're gonna add the butter, and this is the finicky ingredient. And to make it really efficient, I have melted butter here. This is 12 tablespoons of unsalted butter that's melted and hot. And by adding it to the food processor while the blade's running, it just makes a nice emulsion, so the cake batter is good and emulsified. So, food processor on, butter through the feed tube. All right, that's good. So after I added the melted butter, I let it go for about a minute, really to make sure it's nice and combined. And that's it. I love food processor cakes. They really take the guesswork out of a lot of the mixing. All right, so I'm gonna pour this into a nice big bowl. Coconut always makes me think of nice warm weather. So this is a cake I like to serve in the summertime with just some fresh berries, a little whipped cream, sometimes some ice cream if you have it, or just in the morning with a cup of coffee. It is a real treat. Now we're gonna sift the flour mixture into this liquid. That's because cake flour can clump up a bit. So by using a strainer, you get any clumps out so it's a nice smooth batter. Gonna do this in three parts. So I'm gonna add about a third of the flour mixture, sift it over the top, and we're gonna whisk it in. All right, repeat with some more flour. All right, last little bit of flour here. There we go. Sift it over the top of the batter, whisk it in. 
All right, into the loaf pan it goes. Now I've already prepped the pan with baking spray, which is that combination of flour and fat. If you didn't have that, you could just butter the pan and then add the flour and tap it out. Now this is a smaller pan. This is an eight and a half by four and a half inch pan, which is on the smaller side. And I love this pan, but this batter also works with pans that are a bit larger. A lot of pans are nine inches by five inches. That would work too. All right. All right, a few wraps on the counter, get out any big air bubbles. That's pretty good. Into the oven it goes. This is a 350 degree oven. So that's gonna take about 50, 60 minutes. Of course, I'm gonna rotate it halfway through. That just ensures that it'll bake through evenly. In the meantime, we're gonna focus on the potato salad. So here I have a nice big pot filled with an exact amount of water. This is eight cups of water. And this is what we're gonna cook the potatoes in because I have a trick. All right, here are the potatoes. Three pounds of red potatoes, which is a lot, but uh, my brother really likes to take the leftovers home, so I like to make a nice big batch. Now, I already scrubbed them, which is pretty important because potatoes are dirty. And now we're gonna cut them down into one inch pieces. A small guy like this, that just means I'm gonna cut them in half. A big guy, I'll cut them into quarters. And they're gonna go right into the water, which is just handy, it prevents browning. And we're gonna cook it right in the water. So we're gonna start in cold water, which is a trick whenever you cook potatoes, starting in cold water just helps them cook through without falling apart. All right, so that's all the potatoes in the water. Now the trick to making these nicely seasoned and ensure that they stay together as they cook is to add salt and vinegar. So I'm gonna add two tablespoons of salt. So that means they're really nicely seasoned, which is good for a potato salad because you eat it on the cold side and cold food always tastes less seasoned. So that's two tablespoons of table salt. And the best trick, we're gonna add a little vinegar, two tablespoons of distilled white vinegar. This is what's gonna help those potatoes hold their shape as they cook. These potatoes are ready for the stove. I'm gonna bring them to a boil, reduce it to a gentle simmer, let them go 15, 20 minutes until the potatoes are good and tender. All right, the last thing to get going is some simple syrup for the iced tea. Iced tea is a big deal in my house. We make a good quart or two every day. Everyone in the house drinks it. You come over, I'll offer you a glass. And it's unsweetened. So what I like to do is make a simple syrup so people can sweeten it as they like. And you can flavor simple syrups. Great for a party. Today I'm gonna make lemon simple syrup. You can make grapefruit, you can make orange, you can take some spices like cinnamon. World's your oyster when it comes to simple syrup, but lemon, house favorite. And the simple syrup ratio is very easy. It's one part water, one part sugar to one tablespoon of citrus zest. So to fill my bottle, I know I need one and a half, one and a half, one and a half. It's one and a half cups of sugar. There we go. One and a half cups of water. And this is good water. This is the filtered water from my fridge. And then last but not least, some lemon zest and it's one and a half tablespoons of lemon zest. Thereabouts. The other thing is the simple syrup takes on this beautiful hue that looks like lemons because the color really seeps into the syrup, even though we're gonna strain out the zest. All right, that looks pretty good. All right, this is ready for the stove. Only needs to cook for about five minutes to dissolve the sugar and infuse that lemon flavor. Then I'm gonna let it cool. And when we're back, we're gonna get started on the potato salad. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this video. Did you know that you can stream every season of your favorite shows from America's Test Kitchen anywhere, anytime, and ad-free? With an all-access digital membership, you can unlock thousands of recipes that have been rigorously tested by our experts. Not to mention unbiased equipment and ingredient reviews available at home or on the go with our mobile app. Visit cookscountry.com to start your free trial. All right, those potatoes are finishing cooking. That coconut cake is still in the oven baking. It's time to make the dressing for the potato salad. So here I have a nice big bowl. This is the serving bowl, and this is what we're gonna make the dressing into. It's a lemony, herby dressing. Starts with lemon zest. You want about two teaspoons of lemon zest. And the fresh lemon zest, and we're gonna add a few fresh herbs. It is the ultimate summer potato salad, in my opinion. All right, now we're gonna get some lemon juice. What about three tablespoons of lemon juice? Again, I'm gonna do it right into the bowl. One, two. Let's squeeze a little harder so I can get a little more out. Oh yeah, these are juicy guys, I like it. All right, that's pretty good. All right, a little salt and pepper. And a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of pepper. There we go. 
Now we're gonna whisk in the olive oil. It's a third of a cup of good extra virgin olive oil. Just gonna whisk it in while drizzling slowly. Oh, the pepper. By doing this, it just really emulsifies the oil into the lemon juice. We can re-whisk the dressing before we add anything to it, but we're actually gonna use a little bit of the dressing to flavor the potatoes as they cool. All right, that looks good. Time to check those potatoes. Just wanna check them with a fork. You can see they're starting to fall apart, which is a good sign they're tender. With a fork, nice and tender throughout. All right, time to take them off the heat. Gonna drain them and then I'm gonna spread them out over a rim baking sheet. All right, the potatoes are nicely cooked and while they're cooling, still warm, I'm gonna drizzle them with just a little bit of the dressing, just two tablespoons. Just helps them absorb that flavor as they cool. We're gonna set these aside for 30 minutes, let them cool. I'm gonna toss them around a little bit once they've cooled, that way they won't break up, but they'll all have access to that dressing. Now it is time to check that coconut cake. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, oh, the smell is good. All right, now the best way to tell if it's done is to take a wooden skewer. We're gonna poke it right in the middle. You want it to come out with no batter on it, just a few moist crumbs. Oh, that looks good. Nice and cooked through. All right, perfectly baked. I'm gonna let this cool in the pan about 10 minutes, let it firm up. Then I'm gonna take it out of the pan and let it cool completely. i put this on the back counter to rest. All right. Now it is time to get those steak sandwiches ready, starting with the magic sauce. Now to make this, I'm gonna use a mini food processor. You can use a full-size food processor, but with small amounts of ingredients, I think these minis work really well. And it starts with mayonnaise. We're gonna use three quarters of a cup of mayonnaise. Again, using these really indispensable, adjustable measuring cups. Just makes measuring unusual ingredients, sticky ingredients, a breeze. All right three quarters of a cup of mayonnaise, right into the mini food processor, tablespoon of Dijon, tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. And I know when I first made this recipe, I thought Dijon, balsamic vinegar, and blue cheese, that's nuts. I gotta tell you, this sauce is bananas good. All right, now for the blue cheese, three ounces of blue cheese, a mild creamy blue works best for this. Just wanna crumble it right into the food processor. Food processor will obviously do the bulk of the work of making this a nice smooth sauce, but give it a little head start with some crumbling. Last ingredient, a little bit of black pepper, just a quarter of a teaspoon. And we're gonna let it rip until it's nice and smooth. Takes as long as it takes, depending on the size of your food processor. All right, let's take a look. Scrape it down. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know what it is about the combination of these flavors. I think if you ask someone to identify what's in it, they would have a hard time coming up with that. It is just delicious. All right, I'm gonna leave it in the food processor because we're gonna spread it on the sandwiches before we make it. No need to dirty another bowl. All right, now let's talk about the rolls for the sandwiches because they're important. It's a big part of a sandwich. We're gonna use these ciabatta rolls, which if you can find them, they are brilliant here. Of course, you could use whatever roll you have, but we're gonna grill the rolls too so they take on a little flavor. Before we grill them, we're just gonna brush them with a little bit of olive oil. So here I have a little olive oil in a bowl, just the cut sides. Get these ready for the grill. And because I'm brushing the rolls with oil, talking about the grill, it is really close to grill time, which is perfect. The cake's cooling, the potatoes are cooling. Once you get to this point, dinner's not far behind. All right, that looks good. Put these back together. That's it for the rolls. Now for the star of the show, the skirt steak. Ah, here it is, the skirt steak, which is a great cut for the grill. It cooks like that, brilliant on sandwiches, great for fajitas, can be kind of hard to find, so when you see it, grab it. Now, you want about a pound of steak for this recipe, and sometimes they're sold in big, long pieces that you can cut up like this. At my store, they actually sell them like this, so it's ready to go. This just makes it easier to maneuver on the grill. So, they've been patted dry, just gonna season them with a little salt and pepper. Now, these steaks need very little embellishment, just a little salt and pepper. 
And you can see they have all that intramuscular fat that's gonna render and that's what makes these steaks taste so juicy. All right, we're ready to head outside. The steaks are ready, the rolls are ready. Just gonna get cleaned up and fire up the grill. If you're looking for even more culinary inspiration, check out the complete Cook's Country TV show cookbook. More than 600 recipes from every season are condensed into this book. It's jam-packed with every recipe we featured on the show, plus helpful guides, tips, and product reviews. To order your copy, visit cookscountry.com. We're outside and the grill is good and hot. Now to heat it up, whoo! She's a hot one. I put all the burners on high, cranked them up. That just burns off anything that was stuck to the grill grate from last time I cooked. Now is the perfect time to clean and oil the grill. Trusty grill brush, just scraping any burnt bits off the grill. Looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna oil the grill grates and I always oil the grill grates before I cook anything. And if I'm cooking something on the delicate side, which we're not today, but if I were doing fish or a delicate piece of chicken, something that would stick, I would rub this oil on the grill grate, oh, easily 10, 15 times and build up a nice non-stick surface. But these steaks won't stick. All right, first up, the skirt steaks. Now these, very thin, they cook super fast, about two to three minutes a side. Little trick, I lined this with foil, because now I can roll this up, I can recycle this, and I have a clean tray to bring the cook steaks back inside. All right, now you don't need to do this, but it's been instilled in me since culinary school, getting that cross hatch, which means you lay the steaks on one diagonal and then you flip them part way through to get that traditional cross hatch. Now you notice I'm leaving the lid on the grill up. That's because this grill right here is a hot rod and each of these burners is 25,000 BTU. So there is heat to spare here. But if your grill wasn't as powerful, you might want to put the lid down to trap some of that heat so the steak cooks through nicely. All right, it's been a couple minutes on this side. Time to flip them over. Oh ho ho. Flip them over, that looks pretty good. That's a nice amount of charring that adds that good flavor. And again, just two to three minutes per side. Hot heat, because you want to get that char in that small cooking time. Now, you can temp these steaks, medium rares 120 to 125, but they're so small and so thin that you never get an accurate reading. Whereas two to three minutes a side, you're never wrong. So you can see this one, so I'm gonna take that off first. This guy, thing. all right, we're gonna take these off. Let them rest a little bit. On go the rolls. Gonna do cut side down. These rolls just take a minute or two per side. Gonna get some nice charring, a little toasty. All right, oh, that little bit of charring around the outside is just how I like it. Starting to get toasty in the middle. You can also tell where the hot spots on a grill are using a simple piece of bread. Let's see, let's give the ones up here in the front corner little chance to get a little more charred. Oh, you can see nice and toasted on the back side. This one's perfect. Oh, nice. This just takes the steak sandwiches right over the edge into amazing. I mean, so fast too. All right, let's bring these inside and make some sandwiches. All right, the steaks and rolls are grilled. They're resting and it's time to finish the potato salad. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna finish it with a lot of fresh herbs, which obviously you add just before serving so they maintain their freshness. So we have three herbs. We're gonna use parsley, tarragon, and chives. You want about three tablespoons of each. With parsley, I don't like getting the stems in there. I think they have a bit of a bitter flavor, but I do store these in the freezer and I add them to stock when I'm making it because they add a lovely flavor to stock. Next up, the tarragon. Same deal, about three tablespoons. Obviously I washed these already, so now I'm just picking the leaves off the stems. Oh, tarragon is Ian's favorite. Man hates dill, loves tarragon. So we have tarragon a lot. All right, now I'm just gonna chop these up kind of coarsely, chop them up together since they're all going in the same place. Oh, I love that smell when the herbs start to release their aroma. That's why it's really important to add them at the last minute. All right, that's good. Now for the chives, again, about three tablespoons. All right, I'm gonna trim the ends here. Slice them nice and thin. Mmm. All right, so into the bowl this goes. So again, that's the dressing I made earlier. So we're gonna add all of the herbs. 
Next, I'm gonna add some onion. This is half a cup of chopped yellow onion. You notice it's in a strainer. That's because I gave it a quick rinse. Rinsing onion is a terrific trick. Just takes that harshness, sometimes it's a bit hot, right out of the onion, so it's easier to eat raw. All right, now in go the potatoes that have been cooling. Again, they had a little of that dressing on them. I stirred them while they were sitting there on the sheet pan. Right off the tray, right into the bowl. Now just gently tossing. I know there's that little well in the bottom of this bowl. So I'm going in there, getting the dressing, bringing it up through the potatoes. Give the bowl a little clean. Sometimes this works, sometimes this doesn't. Sometimes it just makes a smeary edge. If you really ever want to do a nice presentation on a plate, you should get a little bowl with warm water and a dash of vinegar. That vinegar really takes the oil off any rimmed plates. And in fact, if you're in a restaurant, the pass through, before the plates go out the door, there is someone there with a little bowl and a little rag doing just that. All right, one more ingredient. I almost forgot it. Capers. We're gonna add two tablespoons of capers. Now these were bought in the jar and I gave them a good rinse. Just gonna give them a quick chop before we add them to the salad. You definitely have to rinse them because they have a real strong vinegary brine that they're packed in. And that vinegary brine is a bit much for the salad. By chopping them, they just have a little bit more sticking power so they really incorporate a little better into the salad. All right, back up we go. Now it looks right. Sort of a French style salad with the olive oil and all the herbs and the capers. And this salad holds well for days. You can ask Uncle Rip about that. All right, oh, that looks good. He's gonna love that. All right, let me clean this up a bit and then I'm gonna show you one of my other all-time favorite easy summer side dishes. It's tomatoes. Now, one thing about Uncle Rip is he has a huge garden. He grows a ton of kale, a ton of green peppers, and a ton of tomatoes. And whenever he comes to visit, he brings me the raw food and then I make dinner for him and he can take home the leftovers. His tomatoes are the best. So when he brings them to me, I don't like to do much to them. Slice them up, put a little salt and a little pepper on them, that's all. But for salt, I use the good stuff. This is Malden sea salt. Any really good sea salt would be great just helps bring out the flavors. And especially when you serve it with this meal, there's so many herbs and flavors in the potato salad that it kind of bleeds over on the plate and you just get a whopping sense of summer. Little ground pepper. I know he grows beautiful tomatoes. These are heirloom tomatoes. They come in a wide variety of colors. And it's fun to just lay them on the platter and see all the different styles and flavors of tomatoes. I mean, that couldn't get any easier. All right, time for the steak. Here is the skirt steak. Ugh. All right, time to slice it up and make some good looking sandwiches. All right, so the thing about skirt steak, it has a very distinctive grain. In fact, you can see the grain running this way. And to make nice tender pieces of meat, you wanna slice across the grain. And this is again why we cut it into four pieces, because if it was a big log piece, it would be hard to slice against the grain. So against the grain, nice thin slices. That way, when you make a steak sandwich, you're not tugging on the meat with every bite. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Because it's going in a sandwich, you don't have to be too precious with exactly how it looks. Ready for the sandwiches. This is a killer sandwich board that I had Ian make for me, specifically for sandwiches and cheese boards. It's a beautiful piece of ash. The best part is he carved out little handles right here so I can pick it up easily off the counter. Brilliant. Okay, so for the sandwiches, get the tops next to the bottoms. Bottom top, bottom top, bottom top, bottom top. You go here. All right, now, for the dressing, the magic steak sauce dressing. I'm gonna put a little on each roll. I don't go light with this stuff. It is just too good. Or once I made one of these sandwiches for my husband Ian, and I had a little left over, and he took the sandwich apart, went back, and slathered more on his roll. It's just that good. Now time for the steak. I'm gonna put it right on the bottom of each sandwich. All right, let's go put some more pieces back on this first guy. Oh yeah, that looks pretty even. All right, that's it for the steak. Now to top it off, just a little fresh baby arugula. And that little bit of bitterness and that fresh flavor, it goes a long way on these sandwiches. It is hard not to salivate when making these sandwiches. I feel like Ziggy, just about to drool. All right, 
Last but not least, some sliced red onion. You know, once I put pickled red onion on the sandwich, I liked the fresh onion better. There's just so much flavor going on in that dressing that it kind of fought with it. So a little red onion goes a long way. Okie dokie, on go the lids. You get to come to the party. And you get to come to the party. It's always a party when Uncle Rip shows up. Now give each sandwich a nice slice in half. I'm gonna slice it on the bias so you get a really nice sense of what's in the sandwich. Also just looks pretty. And on the sandwich board they go. Now normally I'd say this could serve a crowd, but I have witnessed many a person eat one of these entire sandwiches because you just can't stop. To bring this together. And what goes better with a nice summer meal like this than some homemade iced tea, which we have around here always. We have a favorite brand, of course. It's a cold brew. I have to order it by the case online. Oh, everybody in my family loves this iced tea. And it's unsweetened, so that's where the simple syrup comes in. We make our tea unsweetened, which is why I like keeping this lemon simple syrup on hand. And this stays in the fridge for a while. We use it for all sorts of iced teas, lemonades, cocktails. Garnish with you know, a little lemon, old school lemon on the side of the glass, and fresh mint. And as the mint gets down into the iced tea, oh, lemon mint tea, so refreshing. All right, that's it for the tea. Don't mind if I do. Oh, a sandwich. I'm gonna take a nice thick slice of tomato. And of course, some of this potato salad. And I love how the juices from the potato salad work their way a little bit over towards the tomatoes. First up, the potato salad. Mmm, mmm. Hits of fresh herb, those little bit of capers. And I love how the potatoes are so well seasoned with vinegar and salt. Now, for the main event. <laughs> I have never had a finer steak sandwich. And every time I make them, I'm surprised and it makes me Google at how good they are. A little iced tea. Mmm. Perfect summer lunch. Not to forget, we have that coconut pound cake to finish it off. Time for coconut pound cake. I'm gonna slice right into this. It's nice and cool. I really let this cool to room temperature. And I don't slice the whole thing all at once because Uncle Rip likes to take home a big chunk of it. So I'm just gonna cut a few slices. Hearty slices, mind you. And this is good as a nice summery dessert. Also great with coffee or tea in the afternoon. Oh yeah, you can see that nice texture. It's very delicate. Not like that standard, really heavy pound cake. You can serve it perfectly on its own. I like adding a little whipped cream. Oh yeah, a little on the loose side. That's how I like my whipped cream. A couple raspberries. Now for a little taste. Cake raspberry whipped cream. Mmm. <laughs> mm. Perfect. It has so much flavor with that coconut. It's like a little surprise. You weren't expecting it. And it's so tropical tasting. Perfect for summer. Perfect way to end the meal. See you next time. Thanks for watching. What'd you think? Leave a comment below and let me know what you're excited to cook this week. You can get today's recipes and more for free at our website.